Testing. I am not sure if we are live or not. Let me. Testing. 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 Okay. Testing. Thank you. Okay. Testing. Hello, hello. I'm Thank you. Okay. Testing. Hello, hello. I'm Thank you. Okay. I, I'm meaning uh, where that other audio is coming from. Uh, okay, so here we go. Let's get rid of that. All right. Uh, let's see. Hola, chess people. Welcome. Today, this is test stream number two on Twitch. Any technical feedback as to I can't see this, I can't hear that, uh, let me know. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. Here, the intent is for a back to school stream since, uh, you know, students went back to school in August, which is nice, of course. And the after school chess classes generally don't start right away. Um, we usually start later in September or in October. It depends on the school district. Uh, so this is what that class is. This is, stream is going to be uh, in preparation, you know, the first class back to competitive chess after the summer kind of thing. Some of you students are playing at your school's chess club maybe you're playing against other classmates maybe you're playing against other schools and perhaps we haven't been playing competitive chess in the summer so what do we do to get back in the groove well let's start with the very minimums the very minimums now on our turn to move what do we have to do at minimum to play passably well we don't need to find the best move. We just need to avoid a blunder. What do we need to do at minimum? Well, first thing we have to do is handle threats properly. Let's have some agreement on working definitions. Threat, what does that mean? A threat can be a noun. Or a verb, it can be an expression of an intention to inflict pain, injury, or evil, or a possible danger, a threat. It's out of the dictionary I've used for 20 years. And ironically, when I went to look up the word blunder, I flipped right to the page. Out of 880 pages, I flipped to the exact page blunder was on. We'll get to blunders shortly. But threats. So let me... And let's see, scoreboard. Let's put Adri Kuo up there. And bam, bam. Bam. Let's make it a little smaller. I don't know if I'm going to use tally marks for the scoreboard or just the number. I don't know. We'll uh, actually, you know what? Let's just use the number and I'll put it in the same box. All right. So let's go to deal with threats. Hopefully the, let's see here. In terms of the video keeping up with the audio, I did cut the frame rate in half. It was 60 for our first test stream. This is at 30, so it shouldn't drop as many frames. I, As I understand it, I could be entirely wrong. And playing with these technical settings uh, is something that's going to come via experience for me. So uh, hopefully we don't drop as many frames. Okay, so dealing with threats. After the opponent moves in a game of chess, the first thing we do is ask ourselves, sub-vocally in our head, 
and yes, chess players have to talk to ourselves in our head. So we have to ask ourselves, what are my opponent's threats? And threats, the S as in plural, multiple threats. So the opponent's trying to do harm to your army. Where? It's the same question. It tries to get to the same truth as what does my opponent intend to do? What does my opponent want? So let's go through... An example that I think uh, some of us are familiar with. So let's go here. I let's see. What are you seeing? Let me check. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Here we go. Okay. So for our purposes with the streams on Twitch and the YouTube. VODs, I'm going to keep the board orientated the same. White's always going to be on the bottom, and black's going to be on the top. And you know what? I can't see the chat right now, and I'm going to have to work on that. Uh, I didn't do the screen sizing properly, but uh, I'll tab back and forth. So, okay, E4, E5. We're going to have knight f3, d6, for those of us into names of openings and defenses in chess, what is this called? The Philidor, the Philidor defense. And we're going to find out a little more about Philidor in a little bit. Uh, Bishop c4 is not necessarily the strongest move. It's certainly playable. a6, not advisable. This game is from 1750, as I understand it. Now, maybe the exact moves are not correct. I've seen different score sheets, different not notations given for this game. Uh, so this may not be the exact same move order as Legal against in his one published game, Saint Brie, I think, from Paris, 1750. So Legal has the white pieces. Legal taught Philidor how to play, and Philidor was the strongest chess player in the world in his heyday, and apparently so was Legal. All right, Bishop G4. Let's go and take a look at the questions we ask ourselves. And you don't have to ask yourself all three. Go ahead and do so. But what are my opponent's threats after bishop g4? What does my opponent intend to do? We're approaching this from the white piece's point of view. What does my opponent want after bishop g4? What are we thinking? Bishop g4, does black want white exactly to pin your knight? So what does black want? Black wants white to not move the knight. They're communicating in English to the white piece. If you move your knight, I take your queen. Now, in chess, what we would prefer at every opportunity to have as many options as possible, to have as much freedom of choice as possible. We want to be able to do whatever we want, provided it helps us. So on a good day, we would like to be able to move the knight. And the opponent's telling us, no, you can't do that. They're trying to restrict you, control you, manipulate you. They're trying to take advantage of you. They are your opponent. They are opposing you. So how do we deal with threats in chess? We have options. Now, a lot of players do not handle threats properly, and I mean in chess, at all. They do not handle threats appropriately. They play chicken chess. They run away. They defend. Their first inclination, their first reaction is a defensive one. In chess, that is 
basically the kiss of death for most players. You want to lean towards the attack. You want to attack your way to defend, if possible. Now, how do we do that? You want to be able to ignore the opponent's threat at every opportunity. Now, a fake threat, there's two types of threats. There's fake threats and there's real threats, or there's smart threats and foolish threats, or there's good threats and bad threats, whatever you want, but there's two types of threats. If it's a real threat and it's inflicted against you, you will suffer, you will be damaged, you will hurt. If it's a fake threat and the opponent executes it against you, they will hurt, they will suffer. It doesn't work. So first of all, you have to figure out, is the threat real? And sometimes you have a choice as to, can you make it fake or can you make it a real threat? So if white decides to put on the silly hat and, you know, play knight to g1, bishop takes queen, you're not making a bigger threat, you're just blundering your queen. It's clearly a mistake. So the real question is, when the opponent tells you, you can't do that, you want to see if you can do it. Here, bishop g4 is telling the white pieces, don't move the f3 knight or else. You want to explore that or else as a chess player in a game of chess. Try to move the knight if at all possible. Now, there are going to be situations when you can't ignore the opponent's real threat. You can't make a bigger threat. Other choices we might have when dealing with threats, you might be able to capture the threatening piece. You might be able to pin, as in immobilize, the threatening piece. Defensive options, flee, sustainment, interpose an ally, shield the target, defend. Some players might refer to it with that word. But you want to lean towards the attack. So the real question is in and this may give it away in this game by Legal. Can white move the knight on f3 and make a bigger threat? Because if so, you have to. Because you can. And if you can't, well, then you can't. So can we move the pinned knight? What do we think? And also with, yes, also uh, these streams, these VODs, and this this stream will go to, uh, assuming it doesn't get corrupted, which I don't think it will, uh, we'll put it on YouTube since there's going to be a lot of material on it. Um, but with any class that I partake in as an instructor, the word of the day is slow. It just is. So we can take our time. And I don't mean here in this, if you want to be fast in these streams, that's fine. But when we're at the board and we have the time, we're going to take it. We're going to go slow. When you get to the level where you need to play quickly, you'll know what to do then. But for right now, slow is still the word of the day in 2021 in my classes. So yes, you can move the knight. So where can we move the knight and make a bigger threat? And this is what Legal actually did. Hence the resulting at the very end uh, piece configuration is no is named after him. So this knight, where is it going? And absolutely take the pawn. And in general. When you move a knight, when the opponent moves a knight, you want to know where is it going next? Where is the knight going next? Here, we got a plus one for Adrikuo. We've got knight takes e5. Let's say black executes their intended threat, as in bishop takes queen. OK. What do we do? Bishop takes check. Correct. And 
another note about this. I should add some notes to the screen. Let's add some notes. Attack squares in the opponent's half of the board. So you can use those squares against the opponent. Let's add some notes. I am going to have to wrap this because there's no way that's going to fit. Let's wrap it a couple of times. Okay. So then knight on e5, very well placed. Loves the center. Attack squares in the opponent's half of the board, so you can use those squares. Here, who does f7 belong to? Belongs to the white army, not to the black army. King has to move out of check. And how do you finish off the monarch? Monarch burgers. We were at university. Sonia's cafe used to have monarch burgers. They were good. San Jose State. She uh, she passed away when very nice. She passed away when we were attending university there, and that place I think closed up because she wasn't there to cook anymore. Ninety five is checkmate. So that monarch is done for. Three pieces on the king. Its escape squares are cut off by its allies. This is Legal's mate. This checkmating configuration is Legal's mate. Maybe there's no a6. You can fit it with the move order. And students of mine have pulled... Whoops. I don't know if that shook anything. I don't think so. Students of mine have pulled this checkmate, um, you know, in the local quads. And that's pretty cool. They're paying attention. So Legal's mate. Let's make some notes. Three on the king. Burger king. I don't know if I would eat that. Let's add the number three. Three is the magic number. One example. Sure. Uh, I think there's an in and out by Shoreview. Three pieces on the king. The magic number is three in chess. Uh, we see three pieces on the king. Let's add Legal's name up here. This was first played as we understand it. By there may be an apostrophe on the A. I'm not sure, but this was legal. If you want to pronounce it legal, I suppose that's okay. Uh, tomato, tomato, but it doesn't matter how you say it, it matters what it is. So legal's mate. So with threats with threats. After the opponent moves, we want to ask ourselves every single move, maybe not deliberately, as you do this more and more, it will happen naturally. Ask yourself, what are my opponent's threats? Plural, aka what does my opponent intend to do? And I'm not sure why that question mark was cut off. I have been trying to figure that out for 10 minutes. I couldn't figure it out this afternoon. So it is what it is. AKA, what does my opponent want? Most players do not handle threats properly. Lean towards the attack. You want to ignore their threats whenever possible. Otherwise, they control you to a certain degree. So first thing we've got to do is handle threats. And this is not about being, uh, this is not about the human opponents. This is a competitive point of view. You need to attack your way to defense whenever possible in chess. So threats. All right, now at minimum, we have to handle threats. And we also have to avoid making mistakes. And you all know what I'm about to say, I think. 
the blunder check. So let's get some working definition here of blunder. What is a blunder? A blunder is a foolish or stupid mistake. To move clumsily. To make a stupid mistake. Now, remember. Avoid mistakes. Avoid mistakes. One mistake and the game can be lost. Period. That's the nature of chess. Sit there for five hours, make a mistake, and yeah, you'll be up all night thinking about it. So let me be very clear about mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, as in to virtually make the mistake, to learn from it, as in, gee, I'm thinking about crossing the street, but I'm not going to look either direction. I'm just going to go. Wait a minute. If I do that, what might happen? Yeah. So you're going to have to use your mind's eye to visualize the move ahead of time and check it out with the questions for the blunder check. So let's go to Nice dissolve. We're going to go to the blunder check. All right. Blunder check is a series of questions that we ask about our intended move in order to avoid making the mistake. Did I make this up? No. Who made it up? I don't know. I did learn it from my old coach a long time ago. I've taught the blunder check for well over a decade. And over all that time, with all of the different students from all over who have used it correctly, deliberately, it has worked every single time. Every single time, with no exception. Now, some kids will, Coach Matthew, I lost. Yeah? What were your mistakes? I, I, I made this move. It was a mistake. Did you blunder check it? I forgot. That's not the blunder check's fault that you forgot. So it has to be applied. And there's other techniques you can use to avoid making a mistake. Go for it. Whatever you want. Use all of them. But avoid making the mistakes. And we have to do these techniques. We have to use these techniques, these ideas on a regular basis, as in every opportunity, so as to master the skill, master the technique. Now, do you have to do it for 3,000 years? No, three weeks. Once again, magic number is three. Now, that's not particular to chess in terms of using an idea for that amount of time. But as I understand it, to master a new technique, use it at every opportunity for three straight weeks. The blunder check is no different. And after you've done that, you will have mastered so well that you can do it without forcing yourself to do it. It will happen naturally, as in tying your shoe, your shoelace on your shoe. The first time we tie our shoelace, we've got to think about it and, okay, go up and over and, oh, I messed up. Let me try it again. I'm only three years old or however old you are. Uh, was, I've asked students, you know, the first time you tied your shoelace, how long did it take? Maybe a couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It doesn't matter. But you have to think about it and then you do it again and again. And, you know, these days, do you have to, no, you just do it without thinking about it. The blunder check is no different. It just doesn't have aglets. So question number one with the blunder check, and we're going to be able to modify our blunder check questions. Yes, this is the standard blunder check. It helps us avoid a blunder. If your move passes all of these questions, I guarantee you, and I'm not going to guarantee hardly anything ever. I guarantee that. Whoops. But I guarantee you, your move is not going to be a mistake. And as long as, you know, in this streams, these streams are for, you know, the the U2100, U2200, that, those type of sections. Now, if you're playing, if your high school is playing another local high school, 
and it's not casual, this may not be enough. You're playing schools in the South Bay area. It, you know, they go over 2,200 and that's terrific. It's awesome. That's the way it should be everywhere, I would imagine, but it isn't. Uh, so this may not be enough, but let's get there to this, you know, expert level, and then you'll know what to do from there. So question number one to help us avoid mistakes, and let me go to it. We are going to go here. Okay, we're going from France a little bit to the south and the west. Okay, so blunder check question number one. Is my move safe? So what does that mean? Well, if you're making a move and you're trading more for less, your move is not safe. This is a very silly example. So we're thinking about as the white pieces. Knight takes e5. Is my move safe? The answer is, oh, wait, and hang on. Let me, before that, let me go to... I am going to go here and one for the knight takes e5. All right. Leaderboard. Okay, so here we go. Knight takes e5. No leaderboard points for this one. Is the move safe? No. Of course, black will play knight takes e5 in reply. And white, we'll go the extra mile here. Does white have any compensation for the material? No. The, you know, double center pawn, ideal pawn center is not going to cut it. There's inadequate compensation. White is lost here. You're not allowed to resign. Uh, student, whoever you are, future student, st online chat, stu whatever it is, not allowed to resign. So this is a very trivial example. I understand that. Now, can there be an exception? Coach Matthew, can there be an exception? What if you knowingly want to give away more for less? Can you have an exception to blunder check question number one? And let me go back to... Here, okay. So can we have an exception to blunder check question number one? Here, of course, the knight is not safe. No compensation, inadequate compensation. Black wins. So, Coach Matthew, what if, let's say we're playing against Damiano's defense, and you're not playing Tate, you're playing someone else. So, if you knowingly want to give away more for less and you have logical reasons for your move, you're sacrificing knowingly, go ahead. There can be an exception to blunder check question number one, such as here. White to play, and this move may be incredibly obvious based on the discussion, Against Damiano's defense, white to play. What is recommended for the white pieces after e4, e5, knight f3, f6? Just pawn f6. White to play. What do we? What do we do? Yep, you take. Now, is it safe? No, it's not safe. But that's okay. Now, if you're playing against a Damiano player who knows what they're doing, you're going to see queen e7. Let's look at this very quickly before we go to f takes e5. So queen e7, and this is, I, you know, who plays Damiano's defense these days? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. But this is one of those situations where if you know something about the opponent, you're playing a tactical wizard, and they're playing Damiano's, look out. Okay, use a little bit of caution, or if not, a lot more. 
This knight, where do you want to go? You can go to c4, and the queen's going to take back, and then you go to e3. The bishop is going to go to... E2, the king is going to castle, and then you're going to use the E file against the queen and the king. You know, pretty basic setup. Whoops. There we go. You can also go back to F3 if you want. And note how the knight on C4, of course, uh, when it goes to E3, it sustains the G pawn, so the bishop can move. So knight f3, queen takes, and then bishop e2, you're going to castle short anyways, you know, rookie one kind of thing. Uh, black's got a, some trouble on the e-file, potentially. Potentially. Once again, it depends on who's playing it, but most people cannot play Damiano's defense, which is why you don't see it too often. So that's how black should try to handle it, as I understand Damiano's. Uh, have I ever played Damiano's? I played Domino's. I don't know if I've played Damiano's. So, okay, pawn f6, and take, and if pawn takes, white to play, and what are we thinking here? You took, why does white take on e5 against Damiano's defense? Yeah, queen h5, and we've got a fork that we're going to use for dinner. Queen h5, and that pawn is coming off the board, period, as in the e pawn, not the h pawn. That's not a real threat. What do you do as the black pieces? Do you drop the rook, or do you move the king? Well, if you want to drop the rook, you can do that. And this king goes to d1. Black still has trouble on the e-file. Bishop d3 is coming. Um, there is a game in, what is it? Master versus Amateur by Hervé. Queen g4, check. Uh, f3 and then queen e6. And then bishop d3. And it gets really messy. Uh, black is down the material. There's different ways you can handle this. But white is winning in these positions. This is no good. Dropping the rook is no good. The queen goes out early, gains a winning position, and can get back to safety. She is not trapped in the corner or out of play. Not at all. The bishop's going to d3 to get out of the way of the rook. Whoops, not what I wanted to do. Let me... Oh, that'll work. That's fine. Uh, let's do this better. I wanted to draw the arrow. So, so the rook can go to e1, and the bishop and the queen... Well, the queen is going to take on h7, and they're going to try to coordinate on g6. And it looks like I'm playing connect the dots with the color green. So... The queen takes rook lines are no good. So let's say they don't want to drop the rook. What do they do? They only have one other choice. They have to move the king towards the danger. King e7. Not a move you want to play in such a position. Uh, queen takes the pawn anyways. Check. King f7. And what do we play here as whites? This is a very useful principle while attacking. This move demonstrates this principle. Bring up unused fours. You got the right piece, yeah. Bishop c4 check. Very nice. And as the black pieces, can you be... Yeah, I refer to this, I, I use the phrase playing chess with a coupon. They're trying to be cheap. Nothing wrong with coupons. It's just a f expression I use. It probably is dumb, but I use it anyways. If you're the black pieces here, you've got to give back material to try to hang in there. Because your king is under the gun. 
So as the black piece is here, you've got to play d5. Now, what if they don't? Well, the king continues to go the wrong direction. And after king g6, white to play and punish king g6. This is why black should have played d5, because now by them not playing d5 a move ago, they allow this move to transpire, which is curtains. It's entirely forced. Uh, if white gets in this move against Damiano's defense in the opening, it's over. So white to play here and certainly win. What do we think? If we need a hint, let's give a hint. You're going to make one of your pieces very happy. Exactly. Very nice. Queen f5. What does the queen like? Well, the queen likes to be close to the opponent's king, but safe. We're not talking a queen sack. Queen f5 sustained by the e4 pawn. This is going to hurt. King h6, there's no choice. Now, typically in my class, when I ask you, does it matter? Does it matter here? You're going to move the d-pawn. You're going to bring up unused force, as in the bishop on c1, the other bishop. Does it matter if you play d3 or d4? No. This is one of the rare situations, positions, where it doesn't matter where you move the piece. Just get that d-pawn out of the way. Check. Pawn g5. You're not going to play queen g5. Black's best try is pawn g5. So what do we do here? Now remember, uh, no problem with delay. If anything's delaying, it's probably me. Uh, how many, what do we drop in here? The drop frames is better, but I'm going to have to play with these settings quite a bit. So yeah, d3, d4, okay, right, nice. What do we do here after this pawn g5 to interpose an ally in between the bishop on c1 and the king on h6? White to play. What do we do? Any ideas? If we need a hint, I will give a hint. There's an old saying. I don't know who quipped this. I should look that up. Who quipped pin and win? Who was the first player, or who was the first human being to say that in English? I have no idea, or in any language. I have no idea. Pin and win. Yeah, the most common tactic in chess is... So I understand it is the pin. So here you've got pawn h4, and the king is going to make a run for it. It's not going to cut it. Queen f7, the king has to go back where it is. The strongest form of attack in chess is checkmate. The second strongest is double check. Here you get a two for one. Pawn takes checkmate. Discovered check on the h file. The pawn itself is giving check at most. In orthodox chess, two pieces can give check at the same time. Only two. So here we've got checkmate. Damiano's defense without a d5. And this is, I don't know what the queen e7 line, if it has a name, uh, but this is the losing line for Damiano's defense. So let's go back. All right, so check, bang, bang, d5. Okay, this is the, the tougher line here. Not that it's difficult. It isn't. Uh, but it helps to have seen it before. So, of course, you're still going to take with the bishop. And the king is still going to move. But note how queen f5 is restricted. Queen f5 is currently restricted. Now, you would like very much to play queen f5. But you can't. So what do you do instead? Well, 
you want to get that king to h6. So you play h4 in order to try to play h5. Now, maybe they allow h5 in order to, you know, back their king off to h7 or something. Maybe they don't. But let's say they stop your h5. Okay. White to play. And once again, you want... You want queen f5. Because if queen f5, that king has to go to h6. Your other bishop comes into play. Their king is on the run. And you're going to continue to open lines of attack to that king. So after their h5, white to play. What do we do? Black has an overworked piece a piece with multiple defensive functions if you can find out which piece of theirs is overworked combined with their king weakness those are multiple signs multiple warning signs excuse me of attack present uh, you've got a tactic right here which black piece is overworked it's got too many jobs uh, queen g5. Okay. There are lines where I, I, I'm not sure where they rear their heads. Um, there are queen g5 ideas. Not, not here, though. You're right about that. So which is... Which black piece is overworked? And when I say piece in this context, that includes pawns. So which black piece or pawn is overworked? Has to guard too many things. And what's most important in this position is the weak black king. So who's defending the black king right now? And are they guarding anything else? The answer is yes. The bishop on c8. The bishop on c8 is the overworked piece. What does this bishop have to guard? Well, it's got to guard f5. And it has to guard the b-pawn. Can it be in two places at once? Nope. So what do we do? If that bishop is overworked, what's the strategy against an overworked piece? Now, you can't destroy it. You're not even attacking it. So destroying the bishop is not an option. You take with the bishop, yeah. Yeah, you take the pawn with the bishop, exactly. You deflect it or destroy it. You make it move away from defending whatever it has to defend. So here we have see... We'll see bishop takes. And if the bishop takes, it's not good. Queen check, queen f5, and hello. Uh, g5 here. I think this is where queen g5 ideas exist, but stronger is queen f7. What on earth is this about? Well, the g-pawn is pinned. So... With the g-pawn being pinned, white's next move is going to be to take, and then you're going to have coordination on h5 with the queen and the rook. And black cannot do a thing about this. This is curtains for the black king. So they're going to do, I don't know what they're going to do. What do they do? What do they do? I don't know, whatever they do. It doesn't matter. Check. And then, ouch. So, bishop takes b7 is a disaster. So, you typically don't see that move being played. What do we typically see? Uh, you're going to see the queen get hit. You know, like a bishop d6. Now, maintain the queen f5 idea. Maintain the queen f5 idea. So, you're going to stay on the fifth rank. Queen is going to slide and you know you're threatening to chop the rook uh so they they can't just idle by so they're gonna play knight c6 and then you just take the knight their king is still incredibly weak white is winning here i think uh 
we'll all agree that uh, white has a much better position. So blunder check question number one. Is my move safe? Typically, you want the answer to be yes, the move is safe, but there can be an exception. As long as you have logical reasons for your moves, go ahead and make the exception. You're sacrificing and you know it works. You've done the math. You've got an intuition. If you have that already built up as part of your game, then go ahead. It's your call. But we want the answer to be, is my move safe? The answer is yes. We want the answer to be yes. All right. So let's... See, we have Damiano's defense. Let's give that a plus one. Two. Alrighty. Okay, so blunder check question number two. Is my king safe? There can be no exceptions to blunder check question number two. And you're going to have to use your judgment with this one. The king always has to be safe. Your king gets checkmated, you lose. You want to make sure they don't get any lasting initiative or can manipulate your king to their advantage decisively. You need to be extremely careful with your king. When you play a game of chess, no matter who you are, you're the king. Grandma plays a game of chess. Grandma's the king. Your cat plays a game of chess. Your cat's the king. Whatever it is, it's the king. You are the king. You have to make sure you're safe. Now, just because you cannot castle doesn't mean your king isn't safe. Just because you're moving towards the danger doesn't necessarily mean just in terms of directionally not actually towards the approaching danger if you're moving in an unorthodox direction doesn't mean your king isn't safe necessarily you're gonna have to calculate what they can do against your king the answer has to be yes to is my king safe with your move the answer must be yes so let's look at an example here by the way, Damiano, let's uh let me let me go back and let's add some notes before we before we take off from Damiano. Let me go back here quickly. Let's put some notes on the board. All right, first of all, Damiano, where is he from? Who's it named after? Portuguese. Not do Damiano. So E4, E5. Knight f3, f6 is Damiano's defense. Damiano from Portugal. Here, this is these are known lines. And these games, these miniatures, and I, I think we'll probably make uh, more of an attempt than I was initially intending to do towards the 500. Now, when I say 500, I mean one thing. Your typical grandmaster, not that there is such a person, they're all unique, but your typical GM has committed 500 games to heart where they can explain the moves in the game to a complete beginner in such a way that the beginner understands, period. 500. We saw Legal's mate. I posted a video on YouTube uh, Saturday it's another one, the Pulse and Morphe. Add that to the 500. Damiano's defense, you've got a couple. You've got the outright bishop takes b7, and then when they don't take on b7. And are these games going to the entire finish? No, it gets to a decisive position. So the 500, we can add games to our repertoire, to our understanding one at a time. Now, how do we get a game committed to memory? What do we do? Well, once again, we're going to see the magic number. What if knight doesn't take on e5? What? Um... Oh, you mean on move two? 
against Damiano. If there is no knight takes e5 on move two. If they don't take, uh, if, okay. If white does not take on e5, and do you, do you have to take, mm, it's advisable to take. Uh, once again, it depends on who you're playing. Uh, you know, if, well, yeah, you, you take. Uh, if you're not going to take, have something else worked out that you know is not in their favor. That's not playing into the Damiano defense traps. And I don't, I'm, I'm not Emery Tate. I don't know all those traps um, that are applicable. You don't, you just don't see the Damiano. And I'm going to have to go through some material to see if I can dig up anything on it. Uh, we will release videos about specific openings and defenses. I don't know if I have any super duper Damiano stuff. I just picked it up uh, out of storage recently. Uh, all the chess notes and books and worksheets and whatnot. So I'll check that stuff out. Uh, but you take on e5. You take on e5. And if you have to, you know, if they play the queen e7 line, bring it on. No problem. So with trying to commit a game to memory what do we do we see the number three again and it refers to writing down now this is this may be the long way and this may be a little bit drawn out and I I would understand that but you get the gist of what we're doing here what you want to do is write the moves thrice uh, I don't know how to say write the moves in Mayan but I do know how to say three times in Mayan Ukshmal Ukshmal U-X-M-A-L so write the moves three times on a sheet of paper, type it out, whatever you want. And that's huge. So let's, all right. So you write the moves three times. And then what you do is now, of course, if you're playing the game, you know, you're writing down the moves, write it, you know, transcribe it a couple of times. Some students of mine, they skip that and they just have the notation. Whatever works for you is fine. But try this out so you write it down three times and then you play it over the board now if you want to use a virtual board fine you want to use a physical board I would recommend that because the physical board is what we use in competitive play you go to a tournament that's held over the board in person you're gonna use the pieces so play through it Play through the game Ukshmal three times. Play through it three times. And if I have a text size larger than another, it doesn't necessarily mean it's of greater importance. Uh, Blunder check is of maximum importance and it's kind of tiny. So you play through it three times. And then, and with the notation, with the notation right there, you're looking at the notation, you've got your board, you're making the moves. And then try it from memory once. Try it from memory once. If success, you know, you're going to be successful playing through the moves, I would imagine. If not, I would rinse and repeat. So then you try it from memory without a notation sheet. And if you are successful from memory, upside down, if you're successful from memory, then try it again from memory without the notation sheet shortly thereafter or immediately thereafter, and then do it again. And if you've got it successfully all three times from memory, do it again once the next day. And then you've got it. So. If you fail on one of the attempts from memory, you go back and play through the game three times again. 
So you're building muscle memory. You're watching this. Your visual memory is going to remember this. You're looking at the notation. You're reading it. You maybe have heard the moves. I don't know. But you're really working it in into you. You know, chess is not a t-shirt. You know, Coach Matthew, chess, merch, merch. It's baloney. Nonsense. It's got to be in you, not on you. Chess is not a t-shirt that you put on. It's got to be in you, the player. Otherwise, you don't have it. It's not good enough. So you write down the moves three times. Perhaps that's optional. Play through the games thrice. And then try it from memory once. If successful, repeat twice more. If you fail at memory, it's okay. Go back and play through the game three times and then repeat. And if you've got it that one time the next day, you've got it. And then that's one of your 500. This can apply to a miniature. It can apply to, say, you're watching the U.S. Championship today and you're watching Lenderman against Sam Sevillon. They went to 140 moves. You can do that. I haven't tried. I haven't memorized it. No, I know. But you can apply the same technique regardless of the number of moves. It doesn't matter. Number doesn't matter. only matters to your mind. If I was Yoda, that's what I'd say. There is no difference in terms of the number of moves. The same technique can be applied. So 500 is not... I don't think it's... I think we might be able to do 500 as in me put this content up uh, maybe in the semester. I don't know. We'll see what we can do. But we're going to make a dent on the 500. And some of these miniatures, some of these games, some of these patterns, the peace patterns peace interactions you're going to see in your games you're going to be able to use in your games yes you will see this material again i guarantee it so damiano's defense all right enough of blender check number one let's go to number number two is my king safe okay here we go so we're going from portugal to spain we're going to spain here we go and this window I have cropped so I can actually read the chat while making the moves. I have to keep working on the software. Okay. So we're going to Spain, which means a Spanish. If you can play this position with either color and not lose against another human being, you're good. And if not, hey, you're not good. I'm sorry. No offense, but you're not good. So in the city you live in, wherever you are in the world watching this, whenever it is, that is the definition of a good chess player. If you can play the Spanish with either white or black. Now, it is an E4, E5 system, and some chess players don't ever play E4. So some players also against E4 don't ever play E5. So I'm not saying you have to play this, but... You have to be able to play it if you want me to call you good. And if you don't care if I call you good, then I guess it doesn't matter. So here, Spanish, what do we do as black? You've got a bunch of choice. We see a6 in this example here. For blender check, question number two, is my king safe? If you're playing the Spanish, and I, I don't know why so many local players, students, you know, kids, and I don't mean my students, but scholastically, the Spanish has had a huge resurgence in the last half a decade. I don't know why. Everybody in there, everybody's, everybody in other galaxies, everybody knows the Spanish by the book for the first 20 moves. You can't get it. It's difficult, since everybody knows it, to get an advantage very early. I'd rather make things complicated, let the opponent mess up because they can't figure it out. And then win. So I don't necessarily encourage students to play the Spanish, uh, not when they're a beginner intermediate player. No, if you want to play it, go ahead and play it. But if you are going to play it, you can play it for a positional advantage and simply take immediately. And they've got a black has a worse pawn structure. Now, of course, you can't take on e5. We know this tactic. If knight takes e5, you're going to see queen d4. This is no good, no good, no good. You can't take yet. I On a good day for white, uh, you know, bishop b5, you get some play against the e-pawn, but typically not. What um, Spanish today at the U.S. Championship? 
Yeah. I was, uh, Dania beat Fabiano Naraditsky from San Francisco. I don't know if he still lives there, but from San Francisco took down Caruana. Was that a Spanish? I don't know, uh, but Dania did beat Fabiano today. Uh, okay, so here we're going to see White Castle. Now, is my king safe? Well, no. Now, if you said yes, I would understand, but... I've been on both sides of this position, and I can tell you from experience the answer is no, the king is not safe. Now, if you play properly, you're okay with white. You'll be okay. So bishop g4, and now let's apply the same question. Is the move safe h3? Yes. Is the king safe? Uh, if black plays correctly, the answer is no. We see h5. What you don't want to do is back off uh, to bishop h5. If you play bishop h5 in this position, there's going to be a g4. And you're going to drop the e-pawn. Uh, you want no part of that. So what we see here is h5. And okay, you know, castle short for white. Nah, nah, not really super safe. I don't want to have a pin on my king's knight to my queen be a problem if I'm castled short. You want to avoid that. If this is a problem, if a pin on your king's knight to your queen is a problem when you castle short, don't castle short. Just don't do it. It's going to be a problem. Now here, is this a problem yet? No. But if white takes, you've got a big problem. This knight, uh, if you chop on h5, you've got all sorts of funny business coming down the h-file. Black's got a huge battery. If you want to try to move the f-pawn and make a run for it with the king, what does black play to put a stop? to the fleeing of the white king. Black to play and win in the Rui Lopez exchange miniature. That's how I would categorize this one. And once again, this is another one of those 500 potentially that you can add to your repertoire. So, King F2 is what white wants. Tell them no. Tell the king no. Doesn't sound very safe, but in chess you can tell the king no. And of course you can't use your queen to restrict. Very nice. You can't use your queen to restrict the f2 square because she's going to deliver the checkmate. So instead, we have a plus one on the scoreboard. We've got g3, and there's no stopping. I mean, you, you know, queen is going to h1, h2. If instead of f3, white plays f4 and their queen goes to h5, you just take it with a rook. There's no stopping this play once the knight goes to e5. So this is a Spanish exchange miniature that white has totally bungled. This is a disaster on their king side. They have walked, you know, taking on g4, don't. Uh, but castling... In this position, you you don't do it because bishop g4, yeah, bishop g4 is annoying. So what do we play here as the white pieces? Believe it or not, you play pawn h3. And there's no more bishop g4 that's possible. You just take it. You're not reacting to it. You're being proactive. So h3, and then white can castle. Now, I learned this the hard way. I, I lost once, and you know I learned my lesson and didn't repeat it. So it's okay to make a mistake as long as you learn from it. It's okay. Better not to make it in the first place. Visual, you know, make the mistake virtually in your mind, but um, learn one way or another. So... Can there be an exception to blunder check question number two? The answer is no. 
No exceptions. Your king must always be safe. Okay, so here we had a Spanish. And a Rui Lopez is a Spanish. I think we know that, but let's call this. We've got... This is an exchange. If I say mini, I mean miniature. Although I think Mini Coopers do have uh, Coach Frisco has a Mini Cooper, and it's got it's got chessboard patterns on it. Yeah, Rui was a real guy. Rui Lopez um, was a real human being. Yes, I don't know that much about the individual named Rui Lopez. They were from Spain, from I'm you know about 400 years ago. Uh, something like that. Um, yeah, Rui Lopez was a human being from Spain. That's why they call it the Spanish. So a Rui Lopez exchange miniature. All right. On to blunder check question number three. Does my opponent have any tactics? We're not talking about Somebody with stinky breath, as in a tic tac. No, We're talking tactics. Entirely different. So, does my opponent have any tactics? Now, a tactic is a double attack. A double attack. One move that makes multiple threats. So, here, let's try it out. What is going on? Okay, now it works. All right. Okay, we're going to have a bird. It's like you're playing Bob. Bobo, the Bobmeister. You're playing Bob. Bob plays a bird named after the English player, not the flying dinosaur descendant. So knight d4. White thinks the e-pawn is free, but they don't blunder check. So... Does the opponent have any tactics? The answer is yes. Black to play and really mix it up in a bird variation. Any type of knight d4 is a bird. Yeah, the bird opening is pawn f4, and they're named after the same guy. Pawn f4, the bird opening, is named after the same individual as the knight d4. You can see a knight d4 bird against an Italian or a Spanish. Spanish is... Yeah, bird. B just like the bird. B-I-R-D. Um, not like the the group, the birds. Uh, I don't recommend playing the bird, but some, some people just like it. And they, they play it because they like it. Well, have at it. But you do move the same piece twice. And the trap doesn't always work. Some players don't fall for it. Although... Some do. So black to play, where are the tactics? White has a lot of hanging, accessible hanging targets. So black to play, what do we suggest? And here we're going for Blackburn's mate. If we're into patterns, that's what you're going for, as I understand it. Blackburn's mate. And I don't mean your checkmate in white right now, but you're getting there. You're already restricting e2. And that knight on d4 on a good day and a bird is a monster. It's eyeballing c2, f3, e2. It needs a helper. And it needs a helper fast. And this is a good example here in this position of blunder check question number three. Because here, black can allow a tactic because they have a bigger threat. So black is going to get a tactic and also allow a tactic. So black's move violates blunder check question number three. Does my opponent have any tactics after this move? The answer is yes, but black can make and execute bigger threats because they're playing against the king. 
here white's you know going for material with this real early f7 coordination with no mating threats oh and i have to remind me to there's another plus one for the scoreboard And one thing I have not figured out yet with the software is how to, because I keep having to flip from board to board to board. I need to figure out how to just keep OBS connected to chess space no matter what I'm doing in chess space. Um, I don't know what FTW is. I don't know what, is that some sort of, stream acronym or something um, so yeah it's black to play and yeah black to play and win white here is if we go back whoops I just moved the text a little bit if we go back here oh, what you do is you you don't take on e5 as white you take on I would take on d4 and double the pawns uh, I just don't take on e5 basically do anything but that within reason that you know passes the blunder check of course so knight takes is a blunder black to play what are the targets a lot of targets Everything on the e-file is a target, and there's another very juicy target with a Blackburn's mate. There's a pawn of tremendous importance that is hanging. Where is the pawn? I think Tony the Tiger could get this one. And that's a hint. Bingo. Nice. So Queen G5. There. Great. Yes. So Queen G5 hits the knight, hits the pawn. If knight takes F7. You have a larger threat. You're going after the king, which all of a sudden after queen takes G2 is stalemated. The king can't move, and if a king is stalemated, now the whole army is not stalemated. No, everyone else can move, but the king can't. Okay, the c1 bishop can't, but and you know a1 rook, but you know what I mean. The army's not stalemated, but the king is, and if the king is stalemated, checkmate may be close at hand. Here, the rook has to save itself. Rook f1, bang, bang. Blackburn's mate. I remember playing this against one of my roommates who accused me of cheating because I had already I, I announced my mate and then I, I called out the moves and then I checkmated him. He said, that's not fair. You already knew the moves. That's not my problem. He walked into it. That's his problem. His king's dead, not mine. <laughs> Go buy a coffin, buddy. So queen g5 leads to a nice little clean finish. In a bird. Now, don't expect to get this trap every time you play a bird. No. And showing this may be a bit reckless of me because some students may get giddy and, oh, wow, look at this. I can. Eh. It doesn't always work this way. The bird can backfire tremendously. So take it with a grain of salt. But nonetheless, this is to give an example of blunder check question number three. Does my opponent have any tactics? Ideally, you want the answer to be no. They have no tactics. Nothing. But there can be an exception. You can give them a tactic if you're making larger threats. So, blunder check question number three. Does my opponent have any tactics? Not threats. Tactics. Does my opponent have any tactics? Okay. Let's go back to the scoreboard. You're at four now. And for 
upping the participation in the streams and the comments with the videos and whatnot, uh, there's a cap on my email account at 100 a day, which I think is really low. 100 a day is is not a lot of emails, but I understand having a cap on it. So in order for me to get the word out to everybody, it's going to take a couple of weeks, if not a little bit longer, uh, because I can only send out 100 emails a day. And I don't want to go outside my front door and scream. So, okay. Adrian Kuo has four. And in some of the classes, we have uh, other made-up... Um, other made up, uh, you know, whatever on the board to compete against. So, okay. On to the last question in the standard blunder check. Is everything else okay? Now, this question, I think, and I didn't create this, but I love this question because it's not fair. And I'm not advocating cheating, no. But is everything else okay? What is, Coach Matthew, what does that mean? What does everything mean? You know what everything means. It means, you know, pretend it's Gary Oldman saying it. With that tone, specifically. That kind of, you know, he doesn't say everything. He says everyone. Look it up. But everything means everything. Is everything else okay means... Gary Oldman is uh, one of my favorite actors. He's tremendous, a British actor. Uh, he's intense. When he when he's intense, he's intense. Gary, just YouTube Gary Oldman, everyone, and wow, what a scene! Been talking about it for twenty five years. Uh, let's see here. Everything means everything. So. It gives you a chance to double check the entire board. Don't forget to look at the corners. Did your opponent cheat? Are you playing the right opponent? Are you taking on a weakness unnecessarily? And I'm not trying to say chess players cheat. No, but it, meaning double check everything. Everything. And this is a bit unfair you know, from a certain point of view, because how can you double check everything? Well, that could potentially be an infinite checklist, but you get the point. Gives you a chance to double check. Did you dot your I's? Did you cross your T's? Did you blunder check to the best of your ability? And give everything another glance, if not more so. Take it from there. So let's try it out. Okay, this is a game played by one of my students at the World Youth Chess Championships when it was in Slovenia. I don't quite recall what year that was, but it's about a decade ago. I think it's a little less, maybe nine years ago. I maybe I think 2012? Mario Bor. Uh, so... Agnes is the white pieces, and here she's playing a scotch gambit. Bishop c4. You can play knight takes d4 and take back the material, but bishop c4 is played. And I was working with Agnes before this tournament briefly uh, because Coach Ted wanted me to help her out, and she was one of his students. So I was happy to oblige. So bishop c4, and here we're going to see bishop e7. Okay, now bishop e7. Is the move safe? Yeah. Is the king safe? Well, at first glance, I suppose. We'll leave it at that for example purposes to get to blunder check question number four, which is linked to everything else, of course. Does white have any tactics? No. Uh, is every if there's some sort of knight g5, you know, black's just going to take. So, is everything else okay? The answer is no, in my opinion. The answer is no. Now, here, if the first move is e4, e5, the targets are the e pawns and the f pawns because the e pawns are hanging after that first move and they're unsustained, they're undefended. 
and they can't move backwards, of course, to shield the f-pawn. And the f-pawn is only sustained by the king. So with bishop e7, the queen is stalemated on d8, and she cannot come to help sustain the f-pawn. So who else can guard the f-pawn? The king's knight. That's it. Nobody else can guard that pawn. So what you need is another helper on f7, and you need it now. Rapidity is the essence of war. You want it now. So you, what if your long-range pieces could jump? What if your queen could jump? Let's just pretend. We're talking about x-ray here. What if your queen could jump? As in jump move. What move do you want to play to threaten checkmate immediately? From the correct angle. Because you can approach a target from multiple angles, but here... The angle of attack does matter. You want to choose the appropriate angle. So white to play. Yeah, queen d5. And you've got a battery there that's super strong. You just take on f7. You might have to you know, set it up. They're going to try to stop you, but you stop them from stopping you. Queen f7, checkmate. So how do you get that in? Of course, the queen can't jump. We know that, but... That's something else. Let's write some notes here. Um, really, does that mean on your end? To catch up? So if that's so, I will keep that in mind. I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Let's add a note here. This is a nice tip. Pretend. The long range pieces can pieces can jump. Of course, we know they can't jump. The bishops can't jump. The rook can't jump. The queen can't jump. Queen is a short range and a long range piece, but she can't jump. We know that. But what if they could? Do you have a good move? Do you have a good capture? If so, get whatever's in the way out of the way. So pretend the long range pieces can jump. And if you have a good jump attack, try to make it happen without jumping. So how do you get the queen to d5? You play c3. If black does nothing, you can take on d4 with the pawn. You've equalized material. You've got a better center. I'll take that position every time. No problem. Can black take? No. What if they do? Black should play pawn d3, but what if they take? You've got queen d5, and already checkmate is being threatened. This is how uh, I gave her the nickname back then of Jorbit. This is how Jorbit's game went. And here, her opponent resigned on move six. That's cool. I mean, for, uh, you know, for her, but uh, not for her opponent's. She saw, and this is what we suppose that, you know, she plays knight h6. The bishop's going to take, and Jorbit's opponent figured there was no way she could continue the game. She's just going to lose. She can't take back because queen f7 checkmate. So she resigned. And that was a mistake. So is everything else okay with... You know, D takes C3, no. Uh, and also, don't resign. Don't resign. Ever. And my students, at any time, are not allowed to resign. So here, yeah, you can use the rook. And what you can also do is castle the king at the same time. So here, what we see for black is castle short. And yeah, you're temporarily down the material. That's true, but let's go the extra mile. Let's keep going with forcing moves. Here, can you save the bishop as white? The answer is no. If you save the bishop, you get in trouble. Hello. Knight before hits the queen, hits c2. You back the queen off. Fork. 
Black is getting the material back. So you don't want that. So what do you do? Now here, you're not checkmating the king. You're not checkmating the king in this line. Now on a good day, yeah, there's a trap where you checkmate the king if they resign or can't find the move. Yeah. Um, but you can't, you can't be greedy here. What you don't want to do is hang your rook on a one. So white to play here, you chop on g7. They have to take back because your bishop is sustaining. Your bishop is sustaining on the diagonal. So pawn takes b2 is pointless. So they're going to take back. And now knight takes c3. White has a much better position, better center, better pieces, better pawn structure, safer king. Black has the bishop pair. I'll take white every time in this position. So here, if we go back, bishop e7 gives black a lot of problems. If if you're the black pieces and white is playing a scotch gambit, you have to get in a knight f6. You can do it now, or you can play bishop c5, knight f6. There's other choices, but you have to play knight f6. Don't play d6 and play passively. Play knight f6. I will do a video presentation of the scotch gambit, uh, but not here. As in not right now. I'll do it here from my home, but not in this stream. So... Blunder check question number four. Is everything else okay? Perhaps unfair because everything does mean everything. And basically it gives us a chance to double check our move, the overall position, and take it from there. Now, you can have an exception to is everything else okay? It's somewhat of a judgment call. It's almost added in deliberately at the end just to make you think again. Now, if your move passes the blunder check, as in your move is safe, your king is safe, the opponent has no tactics, everything else is okay, your move is not a mistake. And in my opinion... If you don't make any mistakes in the game of chess, you can't lose. You can have your own opinion about that, but if it differs from mine, you're wrong. I'm kidding. Uh, prove me wrong on that. I, you know, blunder check and have it have your moves pass. And if you lose, I would be very interested to see those positions or that entire game. I would argue that if you don't make a mistake, you can't lose. It doesn't mean you're going to win. No, but this has been known for thousands of years. You have to put yourself beyond the possibility of defeat before you can try to win. So you can't make mistakes. No unforced errors. You can't be that basketball team where every time you get the ball and you go to dribble, it goes off your foot for a turnover. You're beating yourself. You're blundering. The opponent just has to not make mistakes and you'll beat yourself. And do they really win? Uh, no, you lost. But it's the same thing. So we have to avoid making mistakes. And then we can try to win. And all it takes is just one mistake. Now, a couple of things about mistakes. You're going to make a mistake. I'm gonna. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Chess players make mistakes. It's going to happen. It's a matter of when. Now, strong players, one of the reasons why they're strong is the frequency of mistake. A total beginner is going to make a mistake on move one, move two, move three. It's going to happen very early. And the next mistake is going to happen shortly thereafter, and so on and so forth. So strong players, it's the opposite. You're playing your favorite, whoever your favorite chess player is, you're playing them. When are they going to make a mistake? <sighs> They might not make a mistake in that game. 
so the frequency is few and far between, and strong players do not repeat mistakes. I want to be very clear about this. It's okay to make a mistake. It's not okay to repeat it. We don't do that. So the frequency of mistake has to be few and far between in order to be a strong player. That's in terms of just mistakes. So what do we want to do? We want to play strong chess. Do we have to change anything about ourselves? No, just do the things the strong that strong players do, the strong players do, such as push that mistake off. Don't make it this move. Push it off into the future, some other move, but don't commit it now, if at all possible. And the blunder check is just one technique we can use to try to actively avoid mistakes. If we've never used the blunder check, start using it in your next game every single move. A lot of my students, um, well, I don't, I don't know about a lot, but over the years, a lot of a fair number of students, you know, they don't blunder check move number one. They go, oh, I'm playing D4, coach. D4 is a good move. You told me that. I know it's fine. I don't need to blunder check it. Wrong. Wrong answer. No, you do need to blunder check it. Why? Because you haven't mastered the skill. Once you master the skill, it's going to be built in. And a lot of you students know some of the older students, the stronger students, who, yeah, they play really fast because maybe they don't make any mistakes. How do they do that? They blunder check automatically. They've done it so many times. It's like tying their shoelace. They don't have to think about it. It just happens. So if you're new to the blunder check, practice that skill deliberately every single move and every single game for just three weeks. And then you'll do it naturally without any effort deliberately on your own. So that way you can spend your energy. You can focus on incorporating new ideas, new techniques that you haven't tried yet or you haven't mastered yet and then repeat. So the blunder check. As I understand it with all my students over the last 17, whatever it is, well, I haven't taught the blunder check that long, not 17 years, but at least a decade and more than that, it's worked every single time, but it has to be used and take your time while using it. You're asking yourself these questions. So, you know, if you're going to lie to Coach Matt, and some of the students lie to me, you know, and I, I don't really, I don't take it personally. You lied to me. Uh, no. You know, if, if you lie, oh, whatever. It's your decision, not mine. I'm not the one telling the lie. But if you're asking yourself a question, don't lie to yourself. You're asking yourself, is my move safe? Get to the truth of that question. Give yourself a truthful answer. And if that takes time to figure out, if any of these questions takes a minute, a couple minutes, take the time to calculate it. It's okay. Don't lie to yourself and blunder check. So the avoidance of mistakes, very, very important. At minimum, we're going back to competitive chess. We didn't play over the board for, you know, over the summer or in the last couple of years. We're going back to play with our buddies, play in the league, play. Okay, we need to get back into playing shape. At minimum in our games, and this is not outside the game, you know, in our games, handle threats properly and have the right attitude about it. What are my opponent's threats? What does my opponent want? What does my opponent intend to do? And blunder check every single move. And at minimum, that'll cut it. For a U2100 section, Blunder check by itself is rated 1800, so that covers a lot of ground by itself. So try that out at home, and let's you know see how it goes. If it works, let me know. If it doesn't work, let me know. There are other techniques, other ideas that we can use aside from the blunder check, but start there. So there's other things we can do in our turn to move will we talk about that yes are we going to talk about it today no of course there's things that need to be done on the opponent's clock we're going to discuss those later not today so this was basically what i had prepared for today in terms of the material 
Uh, if there's any questions about any of this, feel free to ask. And Adrian wins the leaderboard scoreboard uh, scoreboard scoreboard for the day with four. Nice. Okay. Um, thanks for the assistance with the stream, by the way. Uh, with the feedback and comments. So any any questions about how to handle threats in a game of chess? Basically, you want to escalate the violence in chess. If you can, ignore their threat by making a bigger threat, assuming it's real. And if it's a fake threat, just let them execute it. You don't have to stop them from beating themselves. Let them do that. Or questions about the blunder check. Got it. Okay. Uh, the next couple of streams that I'm going to test, we're going to do another test run tomorrow. I'm going to play with the video output to see if I can try to contain these drops. We've dropped 38,000 frames in an hour 40 minutes. That's a lot. Uh, so I clearly chess doesn't need to be all up to speed with the video, I don't think. So I'll try to play with the frame scaling or whatever it's called uh, so we don't drop so much. Um, that's going to be tomorrow in the afternoon. We're going to go 3 to 5. Uh, Wednesday, I'm not going to stream. Thursday, we'll have uh, U.S. Championship, U.S. Women's Championship stuff. Uh, today, Dania did beat Fabiano. Sevian lost to Lenderman. And Ashritha drew Tatev. She's half a point behind the leader, Nemsova. Robson is leading the U.S. Championship. They've finished five rounds uh, as of today. And I think we'll do the Monday club. We're going to stick to this time at 7 p.m. to, you know, whenever it is we end or 9. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock to 5. Uh, the Twitch channel will save the VODs for 14 days or whatever. And these will be posted on our on the YouTube channel. I'll do that tonight. I don't know how long it's going to take to process, but this will go up tonight. And... You can also, you know, you can access it there for reference purposes. Uh, so stream Tuesday, 3 o'clock, an endgame laboratory, endgame positions. Thursday, uh, VOD, video on demand. You can watch it anytime you want. Thursday, when is that stream going to be? It's on the schedule. It's in the afternoon sometime. Saturday, we used to have the afternoon group class i'm going to start streaming at that time as well and there's going to be miscellaneous videos going up on the youtube channel that are not streams uh, over the week uh, well as we go on forward as well and i'm getting the word out over the next couple of weeks to get more participation in these streams even though they're tests maybe people don't want to participate because it's just a test i don't know uh, but we'll keep going with it so I suppose uh, if there's no further questions, we'll stop it there. Thanks for the participation and all of the comments. Uh, you win the scoreboard today. Uh, what is the prize for winning scoreboard? I don't know, but you're certainly welcome. And whoever you are, whenever you are watching this, thank you for watching. And we'll see you later.